Good morning, everybody. Good morning. There's some new faces and familiar faces. Um, I don't know who's um, new at this, just getting their feet wet, so to speak, uh, in MIS. Uh, one thing I do want to tell you, if you are proficient in MIS, if you do a lot of it, I get a lot of requests actually from around the world about recommendations of people who do MIS. And if you want to give me your contact information, I'm happy to refer people. Um, some people fly to Toronto or drive to Toronto, but um, I, I prefer that you guys see them. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to teach you the easiest thing you can do in the MIS. You do it in your clinic. And my background is we were all we were all trained in uh, traditional surgery. I was too. But for 40 years, I've been doing MIS exclusively. I spent three years in Chicago with the pioneer of MIS. And that's all I do. I can tell you it works. I can also tell you that it's becoming increasingly more popular. As you know, about 13 months ago in the United States, I practice in Canada, but I know what's going on in the United States. Blue Cross Blue Shield will give you a 20% bonus on your billing fees if you do it in your office instead of the hospital. So why would you take cases to the hospital? Uh, anybody done a lapoplasty or a mini 3D, 4D bunion in here? You have? Yeah, on the resident. Good. That's the furthest thing from minimally invasive surgery. <laughs> <laughs> Just so you know. Okay? How long do you think the insurance companies are going to pay for a lapoplasty plate? That costs five grand and you get six fifty. <laughs> and by the time you leave your office, you get in your car, go to the hospital, find a parking spot, change into your scrubs, do your pre-op, your consult, your anesthesia, hopefully your case doesn't get canceled. You do your procedure, your lapoplasty procedure. Then there's recovery. Change back, get back in your car. If you live where I live, it could be snowing like crazy. Drive back to your office. We're, we're looking, what, three hours? I've done six bunion corrections in that time. Okay. Who does uh, partial matricectomies here? Everybody does, right? I know. <laughs> the procedure I'm going to teach you today <clears throat> should take you less than a minute for about $1,500. And I know you're not making that on a partial matricectomy or a ward excision. So you're going to learn something important today. I look at MIS, most call, we used to call it minimal incision surgery. Now we call it minimally invasive surgery. And I call it most innovative surgery. Now, I've got to apologize. I do a lot of these presentations. I can correct the bunion in 8 to 20 minutes, but I can't create a slide or take a photo worth a shit. <laughs> so I apologize for that, but we'll get through this. <laughs> Today, we're going to do the um, percutaneous flexor tendon release. 
It's the easiest thing you can possibly do, and it's important that you learn it. Um, you can do a prophylaxis for uh, diabetics with ulcers, um, or if they, they already have an ulcer. When I see pictures like this, I don't know about you, but I don't want my foot to look like this. This is not a minimally invasive case. But I guess if you want to correct plantar flex toes, you can do stuff like that. I don't want my foot looking like that. So we all see this. Ulcerations of the at the distal part of the digits at the end of the lesser digits. Now, if this is somebody who has peripheral vascular disease or diabetic, uh, there can be some severe consequences if this is left the way it is. Um, and we know what those consequences are. But if you do the flexor tenotomy release, and I'm gonna show you how to do that, um, you might be able to salvage not only their digit, but possibly their limb. This is one instrument I love. Um, Keystone Medical out there, Eric, makes these. They're wonderful, they're double-sided. So one end holds your scalpel blade, the other end is a small rasp. I use these, I don't use it really for the flexors because I don't need to, but I use it for all, all my other procedures. And the reason I like it is, first of all, number one, I don't make incisions. Because incisions, need to be closed either with a suture or staple. I don't use either. So as far as I'm concerned, I don't make incisions. When you make your poke with your scalpel blade, I use the other side, which is a small rasp. I go under the capsule, and I know I'm in a good position because the rasp rubs against the bone, and I know I can lift that capsule no problem. So I use it for all my procedures and I love it. He used to make it angulated and I didn't like it. You might prefer it, but I like it straight. So these are the instruments you use. I don't use the word tools. Carpenters use tools. Surgeons use instruments. Also, the other word I don't say is shave. My patients come in with a a bump on the side of their foot, and they say, shave this bump off. I tell them, I shave in the morning before my shower. I don't shave in my clinic. Okay, so I call it smoothing. So these are, these are what you can generally use for the uh, percutaneous uh, flexor tendon release. So on the left is a 64 blade. I, for my uh, bunion corrections and other osteotomies. I like the 67 blade personally. The 67 mini is smaller than the 67, but you, it has a longer cutting edge. And unless you're very, very talented, that can be a, a very dangerous blade. Um, but it, you can see how tiny it is. I prefer the 62 and the 61 blades. They're both chisel blades, so they're not gonna make a lot of cuts on the skin. They're gonna to get to where you need to get. So the 61 <laughs> is about half the size of the 62. Now the other thing you can do, I fill all my syringes with my anesthetic with 18 gauge needles because it's just, it's faster. It's a, it's a bit bigger, larger gauge needle, and it, it goes into the syringe faster. You can actually do this procedure with an 18 gauge needle. It takes a little bit longer, but it can be done. 
especially if you're a little bit concerned about a diabetic patient, it's a needle. You don't need stitches. You don't need stitches for any, any of these that you use. Um, but the 18 gauge needle, all you do is put it in, and I, all you really need is about one cc of local anesthesia, and all I don't even freeze the entire digit. I just put it under the the web. It might hurt for a second. <laughs> maybe maybe one cc of anesthesia. That's all you need. So the 18 gauge needle. You got to, it's beveled and it's sharp, and you can get the tendon. Um, just, like I said, it just takes a little longer, but all you have to do is put on a little bit of Neosporin and a band -Aid, and that's really about all you need. So, your, in, in, your incision, where you're gonna put your scalpel must be vertical. So you're gonna go right through vertically. And the reason is you wanna dorsiflex the digit. If you dorsiflex it, the two edges of the incision will close. If you do it horizontally, they're gonna open. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So you're gonna put your scalpel blade vertically. Once you're in vertically, twist it horizontally. If you're lucky, you're right on the tendon and you can just gently cut it. It feels like cutting, it feels and sounds like cutting celery. Now what I do is, I hold the foot in dorsiflexion, dorsiflexion and the digit in dorsiflexion. So the tendon becomes very, very taut and it makes it very easy to feel the release. Once you're done, even if there's a couple fibers you missed, if you crank the digit upward, those fibers are just going to break anyway. So after you're done, you just ask the patient to curl their toes and you'll be able to tell if you release that tendon or not. If not, go back in. Make sure that you've got all the fibers you need to get. But this procedure, even your first one, shouldn't take you longer than a minute. After the post-operatively, I like press the pads. I don't bandage these and use the, the kinesio tape for three weeks, whatever. I use press pads. Now these pads, which are sort of rubberized and have this loop that you can tighten, and it keeps as many flexors as you release, it keeps them all on the same level so that they're straight, they're not plantar flex, they're not dorsiflex. <coughs> These, from the typical pad company a lot of you order from, these are about $6 a pair. That's pretty expensive, I think. So that's what it looks like underneath. It keeps either one or four of the lesser digits in proper position. And I have them wear it for three weeks. This is another version of it. It's a gel press pad. I bring these in from China by the boatload. <laughs> Believe me, they don't cost me $6 a pair. I'm lucky if they cost dollar a pair. They're washable, they're comfortable, and you can see the way it sits uh, underneath the digits. It keeps everything nice and straight. It's real easy. 
Here's a young lady who was born with this deformity. I tried those latex splints for many years and it didn't work. Um, whoops. So it was the fourth digit, it was underlying the third. She was at about 19 years old. She was walking on the digit, it was killing her. This is three weeks post op. That's just the flexor you did? That's all I did. Are you using a 61 or a 62? Generally, I use a 61. I may have used the 62 on that one. But you can see it's perfectly straight. I did this probably a couple years ago. It's still perfectly straight. So you can use it for digits like that. It's very, it's a very safe procedure. It's very effective. It's cost effective. You don't have workups to do. It's predictable. It works. Um, as I said, you can use it on diabetics or those with peripheral, peripheral vascular uh, disease. And really, um, in the last number of years, it's very important that as podiatrists, we think about limb preservation as well. It's very important to us. And this is one procedure you can use to, pre to prevent any sort of amputations or serious infections, whatever. And the chances of this procedure ever getting infected I've never seen it. I, I don't put people on uh, any antibiotics when I do this procedure. I find they don't need to. Anytime, like Brad said, anytime I do a bone procedure, I do put them on antibiotics because foot infections are not fun. Um, so I put them on for a week and I have a zero infection rate. Um, I have a lot of uh, social media. I, I post a lot of my procedures. If you've got the guts to watch some of it, because I'm pretty barbaric when I do my stuff. Um, you either got the guts to watch it or not. I do some very funky stuff at my ass. Um, but if you go to the YouTube channel, there's three videos, and these are the names of them. Uh, where I, I, I show this procedure. Uh, if you want to see any of my stuff or get in touch with me, this is how we can connect. I'm happy to answer any questions for you. Uh, I had another lecture I was prepared to do today about um, uh, the way I do Onion corrections, and I, I, I believe it's not like anybody else, especially my instrumentation. I don't think anyone else uses instrument, instrumentation like I do. I, I use dental instrumentation. Everything I use is dental instrumentation. Um, so I have that lecture. If anybody wants to stay later today, I'm happy to give it to you to present it. You just have to speak to. Uh, either Beth or Andrew, and uh, you'll see something a little bit different. But again, if you're doing MIS, I'd love to refer to you in all parts of the United States. Just make sure before the end of the day, you give me your contact information. And if you want me to show you this procedure in the lab tomorrow or any other procedures that I do, because I do a lot of different things. I'm happy to do it. And just remember, the podiatrists love to eat their young. MIS people are very passionate. They love to share, they love to teach. We want you to learn this. It's, it's a great alternative. I don't judge anybody if they do the traditional procedures. That's fine. Never bash anybody. 
whatever works well in your hand, you're getting good patient outcomes because that's what it's about, do it. But if you can incorporate some of the MIS into your practice, you're gonna have much happier patients. Trust me on that. I just had one question on the flexor tenotomy. I haven't been in practice that long. I've done them on 14 month olds for really congenital curly toes. I've had a couple patients come in and they, they said their pediatrician told them, you know, don't do it till you're 20 because it's just gonna come back. Is there like an age where you say, oh, wait till you're 20 and then do it, or do you do it on any age as far as the tenotomy if it's curled like that? I don't like doing anything with children. And any family practitioner, if any parent says something about their children's feet, number one, even pediatrician, they don't make your kids take their socks off. They don't watch them walk. They know shit about feet. And the standard answer is, don't fucking really worry about, about, about it. it. <laughs> They're gonna grow out of it. Standard answer. Me personally, I don't like doing procedures on your feet. Amen. I just don't. <laughs> Um, especially by the correction. Just like flexor like tenotomies, just like the curly toe, like the four. You can do it. I, I can't see foresee a problem. I try the conservative treatments, of course, first, whether it be a, those latex things you mix, the splints, whatever, try and wear that at night. Because there's a lot of people that with congenital stuff like that. But if it doesn't work, that's probably a procedure that is fine. Are you trying to release the, the brevis or the longest or both, or how can you tell what, what's your concern? Well, ideally both, but whatever you cut in there, and don't worry about anything else. You're, you're not gonna cut a nerve, you're not gonna cut an artery, you're not gonna cut shit in there, except the, the tendon. If you get them both, Bravo. That's why they say when you're doing an extensor tenotomy, don't go proximal because you only get the longest. Go to the MPJ, you get them both. Me personally, I find I get a better result with the extensor when I go proximal and I just leave the premise. I don't care. Yeah, uh, two questions. Uh, one, when you do that, Flexor tenotomy, do you, uh, if it's contracted at the joint, the IPJ, do you go into that thoracic into that joint with that 62 blade? And the second question is. Uh, no, you don't have to. Do you, okay, do you put a sturdy strip around there? Because it's going to bleed a little bit. But in, you okay. can. I have no opposition to that. I generally put neo. I don't know if you have polysporin in this country or neosporin. And a bandage. And I put a pad on and I never have a problem. I never have a bleeding problem. If you use the 61 or you use the uh, needle, you're not gonna get any pain. When do you go to the toe crest when they come back? Because you're gonna have a bandage on I can do it right away. Right, okay. And I generally have them wear it for three weeks. That's all. Just a quick anecdote about the gel crest pads. So uh, my partner did something like this for a patient with diabetes, uh, for arterial disease, and SHT disease. The gel crest pads strangulated the toe and went through the ring and amputated. So there's no intervention without peril. No, listen, a anything can have a complication. We know that. I, th I think it was the kidney disease because that creates all these arterial calcinos calcifications. Otherwise. I'm not gonna stop using gel press pads just because of that. Are you talking about the one that I showed you with the string or the gel? No, the, no, the silicone ones. Really? Yeah. Because they're, they're, yeah, you could stretch them from here to Ohio. <laughs> You can. The gray. You put a little gum. Yeah, I know. I didn't make them with the Yes, you can make them yourselves. These work better. 
Oh uh, yes, we'll, we'll have your second lecture after uh, Larry's panel on about three. Great, great, great. Thirty minutes, thirty minute lecture for you. No, I need longer because <laughs> I want them to see something different. <laughs> They'll no stay. They don't need their I'll stay for an hour. Sorry. <laughs> well, we have somebody writing in from the last lecture. Yeah. Maybe after the mic? Maybe after the mic? How about tonight? Serve dinner, a lecture. <laughs> Are you buying me? Hey, Harley, I negotiated. My lecture's already on the um, card. You get my stuff. Everybody wants to hear me. Now I know why I love you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Thank you very much. Appreciate it coming by. Uh, much like your previous president, I have no filters. So if I say the odd cuss word, I apologize if I offend anybody. Okay, I don't expect you to go to the office on Monday and do bunion corrections. Start small, flexor tenotomies, hammer toes, small stuff. But I'm going to show you how I do my bunion corrections my way, which is different than you've ever heard, especially with the instrumentation, as you'll see. So I'm going to show you how I correct my fight. You can't go over your head? No. <laughs> Do you know how many people buy this stuff? How many people walk into your office and try this? Well, they could try it until the next century. It ain't going to work. Oh, the, the, yeah. Do you ever see a before and after picture of a correction with the ads you see on Instagram and Facebook? No. Okay. Somebody mentioned this uh, probably yesterday. This is really a fabulous book. I know they have it. One of the exhibitors has it. Fabulous book. Um, I even still refer to it because the, the picture of it's great. A lot of you have three-year surgical residencies. Bless your hearts. You learned a lot and you're well-trained. You're also brainwashed. So you want to always hear evidence-based. I'm not big on evidence-based. I'm going to give you experience-based. 40 years of doing this. This speaks for itself. Okay, does it work? You bet your ass it works. Let's talk angles and dangles for a second. I love watching the videos on lapoplasty and the mini bunions and the webinars, which they call minimally invasive. Now, how they get those pieces of metal in the foot through a tiny little opening, I don't know. But I listen to their reasoning of pre 
actually planning one of these procedures. And, and the criteria they think about, look at, it, it's, it's just mind blowing. I don't think about anything. Bring me a 60 degree IM angle, and I'm doing the, I, I'm doing the correction. I'm not thinking about anything else but the biomechanics and soft tissue structure. I'm not thinking anymore. I don't have to. So, really, I think there's a picture with, with buttons. My procedure corrects the symptom, but there's a reason they develop the button. And in my belief, it's part of the biomechanics. I have, I get these people in prescription orthotics afterwards. I tell them we're gonna decrease the, ch the risk of this ever returning. Because every patient's gonna ask you, I heard it, he's returned. Well, yeah, an orthopod does it and doesn't follow up, yeah, they might. Here's a before and after. No sutures, no internal fixation, no incisions. No cast, no crutches, no walking boot, what I call the moon boot. I don't know. I'm probably the only person, I don't use the Osada drill, the electric drills. I'm probably the only person that uses dental equipment. And I'm gonna show you what that looks like. So I have, I have two of everything, minimum of two of everything, in case something goes down. So I use these industrial air compressors. They're Jun Air, they come from Sweden, they're, they never break. <laughs> they're amazing. This is my foot pedal. I don't like to slide my foot. The Osada, you slide. I find it a little bit cumbersome, uncomfortable. I don't like it. So I have a dental uh, foot pedal. So, in the earlier days, my air compressor hose would attach the air compressor handpiece. So you see there's no breathing parts here because it's not electric. This is a Japanese dental company called NSK. This is also an issue. So it comes in two pieces. There's the nose cone and the motor. Here's another one. So what I found was, over the years, that if some blood got into the handpiece, it would stop working. So you'd send it into the dental company. $120 later, they cleaned it. Well, then it worked for a while. Until I discovered this, which I bring from China, I bring maybe 20 of them at a time for $15. So if it gets clogged, I toss it in the garbage <laughs> and save myself $120. So now what I've done is I've taken the air, it goes into a unit, which I'll show you in a minute, it's converted to electric, and then I have an electric handpiece. Now this is an old NSK electric handpiece, which I use for small things like uh, hammer toes, small bones, hammer toes, tailors, etc. I only use them for fun. So these, are, this, is, as you can see, is NSK. I've had them for about. 40 years. Um, I had a few of them. They've broken over the years. I still have one. So I really wanted a very slow speed, low torque electric unit. So I thought about what do those nail technicians use on your nails, ladies? 
So from China, here you go, and it works great. So it's an electric unit. My air hose for my compressor now goes to this NSK unit. It's also dental. It converts it to electric. I can control the speed. I can control reverse, forward. I can control everything with it. My handpiece, now I can use low speed, but I like high torque because I like to do these very quickly. With my newer unit that converts the air to electric, I can cut to concrete. Because sometimes if you have a really healthy nail <laughs> and you're trying to cut to it, it can be a bit of a, a, a challenge. That's the uh, instrument I talked about last time. Double sided. I put a 67 blade on one side and then I underscore with the, the small rasp. These are, okay, so I use the 67 blade to make my pokes. These are the uh, burrs. So there's the Isham burr, excellent burr. The Shannon 44, 2.1. If you want to make a larger wedge on your Aiken, you could use this, which is a little bit thicker than this one. And then there's what I call the Christmas tree, the 4.1. And I use the 4.1 on the medial laminates, and I'll show you that. Um, I think burrs cost like over $30 now. The Shannons, many years ago, were made by a dental company called Grassler. When they stopped making it, and I think for liability reasons with MIS back in the 80s, I bought their entire inventory and I paid like 50 cents a burr. So I have enough for the rest of my life. <laughs> Hope this doesn't happen to you, because you're probably going to fake it. This is a broken burr. It can happen. If you don't think, you'll probably think, well, it's metal, I'm gonna leave it in the foot. I don't like metals in the foot. I think after the bone is healed, there's no reason to have metal in the foot. So this happens every so often. You gotta get that piece out. Funny enough, two weeks ago, this is the first time it's ever happened, I broke two in one foot. Now I spoke to the guy who makes my instruments over there, and I have something to get these out easily. So hopefully by the spring summer, he's gonna make some samples and we'll be able to get them to you to get, if this happens to you, get it out easy. One thing a lot of people won't tell you because I don't love spending money. And $30 for a fur is expensive. If you steam auto plate, you're gonna dull your furs. They can't take it. Use the gas sterilization. Then you can use your furs a hundred times. You'll know when a fur is dull. If you do enough of it, you'll know when a fur is dull. Then you toss it in the garbage and take a new one. But if you gas sterilize, I guarantee you get a lot more life out of it. Fluoroscopy. I learned MIS without fluoroscopy. I don't use it constantly during my procedures, and this is what I use. It's a handheld fluoroscopy measure. So if I want to check something, I don't really need it. If I want to check accuracy, whatever, I just pick it up. And I can see it. I have a bunch of screens in my uh, surgical suite. I have one overhead that I used to use for uh, endoscopic plantar fasciotomy. I have a couple on the side here. Uh, sometimes the patients like to look at what I'm looking at. So I can see one, they can see one. Um, and surgical suites don't have to be large. This is probably 
12 by 12, 15 by 15, whatever. And if I wanted one of those large floral skins, the footprint is too large. I also use dental x-ray. Now I've switched to digital, but this is, oops. This is a dental x-ray. So normally you would have a comb. This is a customized collimator so that I can take eight by 10 or 10 by 12. So the patient doesn't have to move off the chair post-operative. So I do partial weight bearing, which is fine. So I'm gonna show you a patient who really doesn't have a bunion. This is just for dental purposes, but she's got really dry skin. So the first thing I do, MIS is pretty much tactile. Now there's fluoroscopy as well. So I'll take my finger and I'll feed, I'll feel the medial eminence. So once I'm behind the medial eminence, I'm gonna make my first poke right down the bone. Because if you get rid of the medial eminence first, you're never gonna find that landmark. So do that first. So, my, my, would, my recommendation is this area, so sort of midline. If you're doing a revered nisham, you're probably gonna to wanna to make it a little bit more plantar because you're gonna do the medial eminence uh, from this area, okay, from the side. But if you're starting out and you want that torque, you can, now, now you can do uh, both procedures through this one. If you're just starting out, what I would recommend, do the medial eminence from the dorsal. Because you can really torque, you can put the pressure down. So that, that's where my second poke would be. So what I do is, I'll do the medial eminence. And what I do is I underscore the capsule I'll put a Shannon 44 in, denude the bone a little bit. Then I use the Christmas tree, which is 4.1. And unless you're really experienced, the 4.1 takes off that bone like you've never seen. So you really have to know what you're doing. But it works great. Uh, remember, the, the, the Shannon 44, the issue, they're more cutting burrs than smoothie burrs. So what I do when I'm doing my osteotomy, I make a pilot hole to the midline all the way through on the medial aspect there. My first cut is 90 degrees plantarly all the way through. My second cut through the pilot 45 degrees distal, dorsal distal. The reason I do this is with that dorsal cut, chances are the head of that uh, first isn't going to dorsiflex. Really, with this cut, the only way that fragment can move is laterally. Now, if you have difficulty moving that fragment over, chances are there's a bit of <coughs> lateral cortex blocking it. So go back in, make sure you've got the lateral cortex. So that's really how it should look. You want to follow the shaft of the first metatarsal up get rid of that medial eminence so it sort of lines up. Some people take a little bit more of the medial eminence off and that's fine too. 
and then the distal fragment moves laterally. If you're going to do an adductor release, that's pretty much where you're going to make your poke. And we can show you in the lab how to do that. Uh, it's a little bit tricky because it's very plantar, really buried down there. Um, sometimes you need to do it, sometimes you don't. The, the way I do my Aikens is I start laterally, cut medially. If I need a, a larger, sometimes if, once you've done the osteotomy on the first, you don't have to do an Aiken. But a lot of times I do. And I just cut laterally, uh, medially. And if I need a larger wedge, I'll use the 3.1 burr, what I call the Aiken burr. Now, you're, you try and leave the lateral cortex. Quite often, I crank that toe, and I do what's called the green stick fracture. No big deal, it's still going to heal. Um, you can also do an Aiken to uh, <coughs> medially. So same way, you can go dorsal plantar into the lateral cortex. This is obviously before and after how it looks. Nice and straight. This is, now, this is before I had digital, but this is a patient of mine. So we can see on the left, moderate bunion, nothing important. Immediate post-op, you can see what I did here. I'm a little bit proximal from the, the neck of the metatarsal. I'm a little bit distal on the Aiken. Now, this last x-ray, when I took the photo, I flipped the x-ray, but it's really the left foot, but it's 16 years later. And if you look at this, you can't even tell anything was done. And if they tell you lapoplasty is the only way you can move those sesamoids over, Hello! I think they look pretty good. So this is before I put the post-op bandage on, so the lateral fragment of the first isn't moved over as much as it could be. But you can see the size of this IM angle. That's the way it um, here's just a little pro for you. If you scrub with betadine, this stuff is great. I don't know how many people know about this. You just spray it on and it gets, it makes the betadine vanish without any scrubbing. Um, available directly from the company. What's the name? Betadine. A great product. Just makes it disappear. Because if you're doing things fast. This is my post-op uh, supplies. I had uh, a video to show you how I post-op split this. But basically what I'm doing is you've got to be very careful on the side of the uh, fifth because there's not a lot of padding there. It's very bony. And I wrap my tape around tight. When I push that fra the fragment over laterally, I use cloth tape and I put it pretty tight. And if they're gonna have any pain, it's gonna be on the lateral side. And I tell them all this and I go through all this. I also give them a pair of custom made bandage scissors, because if it gets too tight, I tell them to cut it a bit. So you can either you fold up some three by threes and put it here. Um, you can use this foam pad on the fifth, a felt dancer's pad on the fifth, just to keep the pressure off it. So this is the cloth tape I use, it's very strong. I put the back to grass on, which is 
and just like the dosage is antibiotic. Um, and then I wrap with Coban. So it's very, very tight, because I want to keep it in place. I don't use it for no fixation. Do you put anything on your incision? Uh, just the back of the grass. So I don't use steri strips or the, the there was that glue something you use. But you don't tape over the incision. Pardon? You do not tape over the incision. Oh yes. <laughs> okay, I, I'll go back. I, I don't know how this, how I could do this, but I would show you the, I don't know, I can technology does So, I have every color and every pattern of Coban because I have it made by the manufacturer for me, custom made, but I ordered 3,000 rolls at a time. They come from China. <laughs> Everything comes from China. <laughs> so we, my patients like to have fun with it. My grandson asked for this this week, a dinosaur, whatever. So we have fun with it. So Halloween, uh, I don't know what that, oh Christmas with the raptors, dinosaurs on it, Valentine's when I call my patients sweethearts. Uh, if you want to get, change your room real quick, this is an electrostatic fogger and I use a, I don't use chemicals, I use a plant-based material that uh, kills all the viruses within five seconds. You just stand outside the room and spray it, it goes under everything, over everything, uh, inside everything. This this is the first unit. It was manufactured, developed in that manufacturer was Canada. But there's there's a lot of these things. They're called electrostatic fibers. Uh, I. As I said before, I video a lot of my procedures and they're on YouTube, and trust me, they're barbaric. So unless you got a strong stomach, don't watch this stuff. <laughs> but you can learn from it too, because I try and teach, my thing now is to try and teach individuals like yourself skills, but also to let patients know, prospective patients who are suffering from finance, that there's an alternative to the traditional, where I practice, podiatrists don't have hospital privileges. They can have their funding corrected for free by an orthopedic surgeon in the hospital. So I say, do you wanna sit on your couch for four months and watch Oprah and pop Tylenol number three? It's like, you know, Tic Tacs or do you want to go to back, back to work in 48 hours? Do you want to walk your dog? So they decide very quickly that no matter what I charge them for bunion corrections, that's the way they want to have it done. I've never prescribed a narcotic or an opioid. Advil, Aleve, Tylenol work just fine. Any questions for me? <laughs> Just your post-op splinting there, uh, bandaging, it looks like a couple of those appear to be embarrassed. Is that intentional just to? Yes, good question. I cranked that pallet over because what it does actually, it puts a retrograde force on that fragment. So it keep, it's another key way of keeping it in place laterally. And I tell, all my patients freak out. Oh, I don't want my toe to look like that spread Flintstone. Yeah. I say, don't worry about it, it's not gonna yell at you. It doesn't. And women hate the space between the first and second. Hate it. So don't, don't worry, once you get into your shoes, it's gonna, it's gonna touch. As long as it doesn't go under or over, we're good.
can't get this. I'm technologically handicapped. I can think with my hand, but I can't, I, I don't even know how to turn on my cell phone. So they couldn't get internet connection. There's been, if you go on TikTok, there's videos. Um, anywhere you go, you can find this stuff. You too. I have a question about patient walking. When you say walking, do you mean like they can just walk around their home or do you let them <sighs> go to the mall and... First two days is when most, most of the swelling occur. So I want them to take it easy. They'll be doing some icing, elevation. They can still walk on it, but I don't want them to go to the mall. After 48 hours, if they want to walk the dog, I tell them, it's like if you didn't have a procedure done, you know when you get tired or sore. You take a rest. But I have no, I really have no restrictions on how much they can walk. I also tell them if they want to exercise, because a lot of people do exercise, believe it or not, I don't, but obviously. <laughs> they can walk, they can go on the treadmill, stationary bike, elliptical upper body. I tell them, as long as for the first 12 weeks you're not pouncing or planking, you're good. I have no other restrictions. Thank you very much. Good job. Thank you.